profitable micro mobility. Yeah. Yeah. Tough question. It is. It yeah. is a tough question. Yeah. I, I actually want to start because I think. You know, I, I think you have such an interesting story that that's very different from a lot of other companies that we've necessarily had and shared. Um, so I wanted to start actually with the wider context of Turkey, because I think, I mean, <laughs> I know I certainly didn't know much about it until I started looking into this, but I'd, I'd like to start there. So sure. demographics, tell me, sure. t- t- tell me through the country. Sure. It's 85 million people, makes it the largest in Europe, a little ahead of Germany. Uh, Istanbul, the main city, not the capital, is around 20 million people, which makes it the largest in Europe. Um, There are around 10 cities that have a population that's more than a million people. Um, So 75% of the people that live in Turkey are below the age of 50. Um, Very dense, urban, um, bad traffic, unfortunately. Beautiful country, beautiful city. Uh, But all in all, great place to do micromobility in. So, so, I mean, I think this is very different from, I think, a lot of other places. Like, for example, if you look at shared micromobility that we've seen in Europe or Australia, New Zealand, other places, um, that's been oftentimes in quite a sprawled area uh, versus somewhere like Europe, which is really, I would say, almost in some ways quite comparable for the... You can say that, yeah. Yeah, 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 like in terms of urban form. Okay, brilliant. That's good. Uh, uh, Useful context. So, thank you. So then... Take us through Marta, because I, I, I was kind of blown away when I first came across you guys. I was like, what? What? well, 46,000 vehicles yeah. on the street, um, you know, profitable. I think there aren't many companies that can necessarily make that claim. Um, take us through where you're at, what, like, numbers of cities you're in, vehicles, all that sort of stuff, and then, and then we can kind of go into a little bit of the backstory, because I kind of want to understand sure. how you got there. Sure. So we have around 6 million downloads, which basically means pretty much one out of every 10 Turk has the Marty app on their phones now. Um, We have 46,000 vehicles, as you said. We have e-mopeds, e-scooters, and e-bikes. So it's a mixed fleet. Um, We have 64, 65% market share. And um, around 90% of our rides are for commute. We're in 16 cities now. Uh, But you know, you could break down Istanbul into three, four cities if you wanted, right? It's 20 million people. Um, And we've been growing for three and a half, four years now. Yeah. So, so one, I want to come back to the commute question because I think sure. that that is just like very fundamentally different to what we've seen in a lot of other shared yeah. micromobility. But um, take me through that part. The, 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 you've been around for three and a half years because my understanding of like, well, I was going to say, my understanding of the Turkish tech market, but I actually have no understanding of the Turkish tech market. So like, you know, other than... It's not that big. No, it's not that big. So, so like... Well, we're, we're in San Francisco, so... Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 completely. But yeah. like, where... Uh, you know, how did you start? How did that even come about in the first instance? I mean, um, this is a statistic that I found out a few days back, but 27% of all Turkish healthcare um, spending is on uh, ailments that are caused by air pollution. Right. So it is, according to some navigator company data, Istanbul is the worst traffic in the world. Um, cars have become relatively less affordable, uh, especially given the inflationary environment. So gas prices are up, car prices are up, so it's very hard to move around the city. And Istanbul itself is um, built on hills, much like San Francisco, so it is very expensive to build metro. Every government has for years have been trying to build more and more metro, but it is still um, not where it needs to be, although it's the second oldest metro in the world or something like that. Yeah, there was a, okay, so crazy stat, if anybody doesn't know this, uh, you're the first in continental Europe. Yeah, Istanbul, I believe so. Istanbul, I believe so. Yeah. Was London first, was number one. Yeah, London was Istanbul number one. Istanbul was number two, 1876, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was before Paris, which kind of blew me away. Yeah. But anyway, then yeah. again, um, it is very hard and very expensive to build in Istanbul because it's so hilly, right? Yeah. You need to dig really deep. So not a lot of metro, um, which makes it really a perfect place for micro mobility. A lot of people moving around, young population. Um, and you know, once you know how to navigate that type of environment, you can, you, you can build a profitable micro mobility company. Yeah. So you started out three and a half years ago. Yeah. T- talk me through the, like, how did the funding look for the first, you know, the first bit? Because was there VC? Was it, because I mean, I, I mean, we've got Lyman Bird and Halbers and all the others who have like managed to get a lot of funding. I don't think necessarily for a great outcome. How did that look for you guys in the beginning? Well, maybe now looking back, it's a good thing. And here's why. Uh, natural selection come through us much earlier on than it did through those companies. Uh, we had to be profitable to scale, not you know be not scale first and then figure out profitability later, right? Sure. So we're EBITDA positive today, and we you know we project to be uh, much more EBITDA positive in the future. 
Uh, but you know, we had to figure out how to be unit economics profitable, unit economics positive, to be able to scale, to get that funding. We, have to, we had to prove to our investors that we could do it in a profitable manner before we scale. So sure. that was the main difference. Sure. And you know, it had its certain effects. Um, our stable growth, and you know, every, you know, every year we went into more and more markets in a more sustainable way, sustainable in terms of the business. Right? Um, it made Marta into a household brand. So in Turkey, an e-scooter, an e-bike, uh, they're, not, they're not called e-scooters or e-bikes. So when people go into you know, small shops to buy an e-bike or an e-scooter, they ask for a Marta. It's like Kleenex. Right. So it's a category name now. Yep. And how did that, so you, you started out with vehicles uh, on the street, what, 2018? Sure. 2019, it was 4th of March, I believe. Okay. But so you, I founded the company in September 2018. Right, okay. So you were yeah, around then, started in 2019, had vehicles on the sure. road. What was the early, like, what did you work out pretty early on about sure. what was, you know, okay, so you can watch and see Lime and Bird and others who are like exploding in this time. What did you work out pretty quickly, worked and didn't work for, for, for Turkey and the Turkish market in particular? Well, we looked at it. And um, we identified a few things in the business model that could be improved. So we did that. Uh, first of all, we believe that you have to be vertically integrated. You have, to have, you have to assemble your own fleets, design your own fleets, and build them in-house. That's what we do. We believe that you have to be focused on a geography and not go too wide, right? which is what we did. We're a Turkey-only company right now. Um, we also figured out that you have to be focused on your operations in every single city all the time and you have to be obsessed about it. So does that mean, you have, do you have your own employees or have you still got, are you working with gig workers? But it's, 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 a, it's a mix of both, yep. right? Uh, but again, very early on, we thought, you know, we have to build vehicles that are for, that would be profitable for an emerging market. As in, where labor costs are cheaper and, you know, purchasing power is lower. You have to have vehicles that are not as high tech, but much more rugged and durable. So we designed around that, for example, right? And we designed our vehicles different for every, each city. And we, we, we figured out that you cannot have one modality and be profitable. You have to have a mix of a lot of different vehicles. So we have e-mikes, e-mopeds, and e-scooters at scale. Um, and that type of offering, that type of service, where you give consumers different choices for price levels, comfort levels, distances, and you put the vehicles within 150 feet of somebody, um, you start to get more and more rides and more retention. Uh, you have less churn, you have more usage. And then if you navigate that, that type of demand with uh, lower labor costs and you leverage that, you can be profitable. That's what we figured out, so. Yeah, I, I, do, I do think it was, uh, the, the, the part that I found fascinating about your, your, your story is like one, you're obviously looking for, uh, like a, what, what happens in a world of lower labor costs? Because I think that's one thing that, um, you know, was kind of explored with the gig workers, part of el element of like some of the early stages of blitz scaling and shared, but I, I don't think was really ever kind of fully utilized. Um, and then the other part as well is obviously like uh, selling into these markets, right? Like your, your consumers aren't gonna be able to pay as much uh, yeah, necessarily, right? So, so can you talk me through that commuting thing? Cause I always found that fascinating. Like I, I find it a fascinating number. How many, what percentage you gain of your consumers uh, commuting and how do you define commuting? So eight to 9% are for leisure. 31% for uh, public transportation connectivity, right. right? That means people are using our vehicles to go to a public transportation stop or to come from a public transportation st spot. Uh, and then the rest is just general commute. You go to the shops, you go to school, et cetera. Um, and that, the leisure percentage decreased every year, right? As people adapted these vehicles into their daily lives, uh, which we successfully sort of like um, made it happen, um, the leisure percentages start decreasing. Sure. And what, so the average, like for, for someone who is a commuter, like did sure. you have particular, like I've seen, for example, some shared operators come out with like a subscription service. So you pay like $30 a month or $20 a month and then you get like a certain amount per day. Or did you do any of those sort of things? Or are people just like literally purchasing each single time they're going, I, I want to pick a Marta? So we haven't rolled out any subscription models yet. Right. We're working on it. Yeah. Um, you have to get it right. Yeah. right. You cannot just throw out three to four different subscription models and hope that one sticks. We like to, you know, again, as you know, it's a company culture now. We want to know what we're doing before we scale it, right? So there are tests around subscription, which I'm sure that, you know, in a few months, we'll, you know, we will announce it. But um, again, it's all about understanding the usage, looking at data very carefully, and then finding out the right pricing strategy for subscription.
which you haven't done yet. Yeah, sure. And 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 for the folks who you know are using those vehicles, when you say 31% are doing like first and last mile connectivity, so in again, I have no context on Turkey. So so like if if uh, folks are coming to a public transport, you stop, should visit. I, well, I, you should I, visit. I'm aware I should visit, yeah. and I've been told I'd by love everybody. I'd to visit I, New Zealand, but I, you should visit Istanbul. Yeah, 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 totally. It's going to happen. Um, yeah. For folks who are kind of thinking about what this looks like, are there dedicated parking spots at the public transport stations that do that do exist in Turkey? How does that work? Like, do you just kind of rock up to these stations? This is like a giant pile of bikes outside or, 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 or scooters? Um, so, post-pandemic, yep. um, with, again, the rising cost of transportation, you know, gas prices and car prices, and increased congestion, people coming back to their normal lives, um, made all levels of government in Turkey very pro-mobility business and which made Marta and mobility in general the star of the Turkish tech ecosystem, right? As a result, we work with all levels of government all the time in terms of finding the right way to park, uh, I mean, you know, making these vehicles more available to people, making it less of a nuisance when parked. So there are different ways we, you know, solve those issues and it differs from city to city. Yeah, I, I hear you. But, but, it, but, it, the, but the soul of the model is free yeah. float, right? You want yeah. people to have access to these vehicles and not one, but like, we want to be a one-stop shop for all mobility needs. As in, when you leave your apartment in, say, Izmir or Istanbul or Ankara or Antalya, we want you to take out your phone, look at the Marty app, and find the vehicle that you want to use to go the distance that you want to go. Right? Yes. We, we just don't want to be a scooter rental company or yeah. an e-bike rental company. It mm -hmm. is an end-to-end -end mobility solution. So that's why, you know, the strategy is to become a mobility super app. Because there are so many mobility super apps in countries like, you know, Turkey is the only G20 economy without one. Right. Right. I mean, yep. Indonesia, Brazil, India, all these very large uh, countries have very large super app mobility companies in there. And, and, and by super app, you mean the Ubers or the Grabs or the, the, the... Well, the way we define it is a company that offers mobility services, more than one mobility service at scale in a very large market. Yeah. So it's a, mo it's, it's a mobility super app. It's, the definition differs from, you know, company to company, founder to founder, but that's our definition and we want to be a company that offers multiple modes of transportation at very large scale. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I think the mobility as a service model is um, one that's been really well explored, or is being well explored by a lot of the like large mobility apps. Um, one of the things that I've seen though is that you know, for a lot of them, uh, there's sometimes a tension between like a government doing it and, a, and like a government doing it and then, or a, or a kind of a private company wanting to do it, right? Like that, I used to work at Uber, that was a similar thing that we were facing. Like we were trying to roll out transit and it was a challenge because it was always like a, this creative tension with some of those like public transport agencies or anything. Is it, I mean, uh, you're obviously going with into this market, not trying to compete specifically in transit. You're trying to be uh, like a, a, a complementary in some ways. It's, I think it's really yeah, exciting yeah, and a very different yeah, way to approach it. Complementary is the right word, right? 31% use it for, public transportation connectivity. Yeah. You're part of daily life. So how is the, how is that, re like how are the the apps regulated in Turkey? So like, how are, do, what how, how are, how are uh, your services regulated in Turkey? Do, so are there, for example, like in Istanbul, is it a, a council, is it a city level regulation? And, it, and is there a cap on the number of vehicles that you can have or is it a relatively, because there are some markets where it's been uncapped and they've been challenging to compete in uh, and others that have been capped and you know, they have different obviously market um, dynamics. Um, great question. So. There are two questions in that, um, so I'll answer them separately. You know, when you talk about um, these large global players, um, Turkey is the country where the local champion generally wins, right? Like a lot of these big companies like Amazon tried to come in, they have very low market share. Uber tried to come in, they had to leave. Uh, there's a lot of companies like that that come into Turkey and are not able to succeed, while local champions uh, are very successful, right? Um, and that's because you need to know how to navigate the Turkish tech environment or the tech, Turkish general ecosystem to be able to be successful. So in terms of our, in specifically about our business, there was no regulation once we started, right? right? But we worked with every, like, all levels of government to build a successful mobility, uh, micro-mobility regulation that you know, allows for healthy, um, eco-friendly, shared electric mobility to be used by millions of people in Turkey, which is what happens today. Yeah, I hear you. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more, a couple more minutes left, and I, sure. I do want to make sure that we get onto the, 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 I think one of the probably the most interesting part of the story as well, which is that you're about to list on the NYSE. Uh, so via a SPAC, 
uh, through sure. through uh, Galata, who who's the uh, who, who's the spec that's been specifically fo- like raise money, but is specifically focused on Turkey, and they're going to do an acquisition. So, I mean. You and I both know, like the the traditional specs of uh, shared micro mobility companies that have gone on to uh, gone onto the public markets. Uh, I wouldn't say the performance has been stellar. Uh, I would probably say uh, the opposite. Um, what is different about what you guys are doing that allows you to feel confident in, in heading into this? Well, number one, we make money. We don't lose money. That's very important. That is a fair point. That's yes. a very important yeah. point. <laughs> um, secondly. <laughs> well, it is very important. Yeah. Uh, um, secondly, look, a DSPAC merger is just a means to an end. Sure. It is just like a traditional IPO. It is a process that you go through to take a company public, right? So that is not, so saying that SPACs are bad is, you know, it's just like you go to a coffee shop and you, you buy coffee and you hate the coffee, or right? you don't like it. It's not because of the cup. It's the sure. coffee that's bad, yeah. right? Or you go to yeah. a new coffee shop and you love the coffee, right? It's not because of the cup that it's good. It's the coffee is good, right? So a DSPAC merger, just like a traditional IPO, is a method. It's the quality of the company that matters, right? It's your margins. It's your operations. It's your services. How happy your customers are. How you know, profitable you are. What your EBITDA is. How sustainable your growth is, et cetera. These things matter, right? And we're quite confident in those. Um, so uh, this being a SPAC is uh, just a method to us. Sure, and that, that's fair. I think that's a, a, a fair, uh, fair response. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm conscious that we're going to run out of time here very soon. But look, I, yeah, for folks who do want to find out a little bit more about Mar- like the story of Marty and like all this sort of stuff, obviously, one, I'm going to do a shout out for our podcast, which is just coming out. Go so ahead. Yeah, 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 well worth checking out. There's Plug a in. bit more of an in-depth interview than uh, what we've been able to do today. But also as well, I think uh, you know, like if if uh, you know, it's, I take it the app. Does it have an English? function like if we were to download the app yeah of course yeah we have a website you can go on um obviously uh, due to the um business combination agreement we signed we have stuff filed to the sec and everything about the presentations online you can go and look at all those things um you can find about find out a lot about the company online yeah i appreciate it um well look i i mean i certainly think it's just one of the most kind of uh we we have really uh, watched the space evolve a lot over the last couple of years, from the, the early, uh, you know, the very very early days of seeing the crazy valuations. And I just I want to commend you for trying to build a company that uh, is shared and is you know here for the long term, sustainable. Yeah, not, no, for sure, here and sustainable. Not, not, not only in like environmental terms, but but sustainable as a business, right? That's what we care about. Yeah, yeah. Creating no. value in a sustainable way. Absolutely. And I, I look, I mean, I think that the, the story, uh, it really also conforms to our thesis that we have at Micromobility about like, why is this space interesting? It's that you can take these relatively modular vehicles, uh, can put them connected to the internet down and build business models that are that are probably challenging to innovate on and necessi- like you can you can innovate on those business models relative to the markets that you're in and allowing sure. for, for things and get low cost affordable transportation out to the masses. So um, yeah, hey, thank you. Of course. Really appreciate your time Anytime. as always. And, and uh, come to Istanbul. I will beautiful, come to Istanbul. Beautiful city. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, 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 yeah. Marvelous. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you everybody.